Thank you. The next item of business is topical questions, and we start with question number one from Douglas Ross. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what its position is on the consultation document Policing 2026, our 10 year strategy for policing in Scotland. Cabinet Secretary Michael Matheson. Presiding Officer, we welcome yesterday's publication of the draft Policing 2026 strategy, which sets out the steps that Scottish Police Authority and Police Scotland propose to take in order to better meet the policing challenges of the future. The strategy's clear focus on improving the operational capacity of our police and enhancing the quality of the service that the public receive is something we very much support. Once finalised, the document will play a key role in shaping the future direction of policing, and I would encourage all those who have an interest in participating in the consultation to do so now that it is underway. Douglas Ross. Yesterday we learned, not from the 2026 strategy, but from the accompanying press conference, that 400 officers will be cut from the single force by 2020, and that officers are currently backfilling administrative roles. That backfilling admission came just a week after I received a letter from David Page, the Deputy Chief Officer with Police Scotland, denying that the policy even existed. What confidence can the public have to respond to this strategy? And I agree with the Cabinet Secretary that we must respond to it, but what confidence can the public have to respond to it if it doesn't even mention police officer numbers? And also, given that the word rural is not mentioned once in the strategy, despite a rural population growing at a faster rate in recent years than the rest of Scotland, does the Cabinet Secretary agree that this is a crucial consideration and what assurances can he give that rural communities will not be overlooked? Cabinet Secretary. Officer, let me try and uh, unpick a few of the points which uh, Douglas Ross has uh, made there. The issue around the police numbers, which is, again, of course, it's a, a draft uh, proposal which has been put forward by the Chief Constable and by the Scottish Police Authority, is on a change in the way in which they wish to have the mix of staff within uh, Police Scotland. It's right to recognise that the nature of crime which the police service and the demands on the police service over the last 10 years has significantly changed. Uh, the way in which they now have demand in uh, the form of uh, demand from mental health issues, from missing persons, from vulnerable individuals, an ageing population, the demand that they now have from crimes which are now taking place within a private place. So we've saw big drops in crimes which take place within a public place, particularly crimes such as violence, uh, and how that's now moved into the private place with an increase in domestic violence being reported and also uh, the way in which we saw an increase in cyber-related crime. It's important the police have the right mix of staff and the skills to be able to actually meet these types of, types of crimes and new and emerging threats effectively. That's something I've said on a number of occasions. That's something which we set out in our own manifesto just uh, last year in the election campaign. And the uh, Chief Constable set out his vision how over the next 10 years he believes that can best be achieved. Part of that is to make sure that some of the transformation which has not taken place, as the Chief Constable also confirmed, in the corporate, in the support role within Police Scotland, much of which has remained the same as it was with the previous legacy forces. And part of that is about moving officers who have been in those roles out into frontline responsibilities and reforming the way in which they provide support to officers through corporate and wider support and organisation. I think that is to be welcomed and I think that is important and I think there's important lessons there for us to consider over the coming weeks. On the issue of rural uh, matters, of course that's a significant issue for Police Scotland. We would expect that uh, to be set out in the final strategy because of course no doubt the member will want to make his views known to Police Scotland and to make his own submission to this consultation exercise. And no doubt the issue of rural concerns is a matter which he'll choose to focus on. Douglas Ross. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, I, I still have concerns that if the Chief Constable was able to tell a press conference immediately after the release of this strategy, why is it not in there to get the public's feedback on that? But I would like to concentrate on one other issue, which is technology. By its own admission, Police Scotland's technology is slow and outdated, and there is duplication of input. These problems were supposed to have been overcome by the merger and the Field I-6 project. Technology is a linchpin of this strategy, but the single force's track record on this front has been poor to date. We now learn that Police Scotland will invest in technology, streamlining processes through greater self-service and automation. This could further distance officers from local communities who just want to speak to their local officer. What safeguards can we take from the strategy that these ties will not be further eroded? Cabinet Secretary. Well, again, the member seems to uh, fail to recognise the fact is that this is a draft strategy which Police Scotland have put out along with the Scottish Police Authority to 
uh, to allow people to comment on and to express their views on. And these are issues which can be considered over the period of the consultation uh, exercise. Can I say as well, in particular, on the issue of IT infrastructure within uh, Police Scotland, the reality is that the uh, vast majority of the IT infrastructure which we have in Police Scotland has been inherited from the previous legacy forces. And additionally, the I6 initiative was actually one which its genesis goes way back to the legacy forces themselves when they were looking for a single police IT system in uh, Scotland. The, IT, uh, the I6 programme has not been delivered on by the uh, company who were appointed to uh, deliver that particular initiative. But the need for IT improvement is exactly why we provided additional reform money within the draft budget that we took through Parliament just last week in order to allow that type of IT investment to take place. That will support the police in being able to make sure they're releasing the capacity they have within the organisation at the present time that has been taken up by the slow and the outdated IT systems which they have at the present time. And that's the type of thing which, as the, uh, the chair of the SPA set out and also the chief constable set out, will be key priorities in moving forward with this strategy in the coming years. Ben McPherson. Thank you, Presiding Officer. For context on these islands, can the Cabinet Secretary provide some detail on how the number of police officers in England and Wales compares to the number of police officers in Scotland? Cabinet Secretary. Presiding Officer, I am very clear about the purpose behind any strategy which is going to be approved by the Scottish Government is one which is making sure that we have sufficient police officer numbers in order to uh, deliver the safety and security to uh, the people of Scotland. We have, uh, over uh, the last 10 years, been committed to 1,000 extra police officers. There are no plans to change uh, police officer numbers in the forthcoming uh, financial year. And the present level of uh, police numbers within Police Scotland is at 17,256. What I am not going to accept is a strategy that follows the approach which has been taken by the Home Secretary in England and Wales, which has been to destroy some aspects of police operation provision within England and Wales, with a 19,000 uh, police officers being lost over the same period of time as we've been protecting police numbers. That has had a direct impact on the quality of policing which is received in England and Wales. This strategy is not about delivering that, it's about making sure we improve capacity and we improve the service that the public receive from Police Scotland. Willie Rennie. Uh, I asked the First Minister about this last week, so I'm intrigued with this question today and the statement yesterday from the Chief Constable, because the First Minister denied that there was any change in policy. She committed to the 1,000 extra officers, said it wasn't going to change this year. So can I ask the Justice Secretary this precise question? If the Chief Constable wants to reduce the officers by 400, as he stated yesterday, will he have the backing of the Justice Secretary? Cabinet Secretary. Well, as I said yesterday, we will consider the details of this draft strategy, the feedback from the consultation, and the final strategy before it's approved by government. So on that basis, it will be yes, because it will have to be approved by government. John Finney. Thank you, President Officer. I wonder, Cabinet Secretary, if you would agree with me that the obligation of Chief Constable is to assess the risks and put in place mechanisms to address these risks. And that isn't necessarily about numbers or buildings. It is about the quality of service. So will you undertake to move the whole conversation away from this obsession with 17234 and rather ensure that the, if the Chief Constable comes with further requests based on an evidence need um, of developing th um, threats and trends, that you'll support that? Cabinet Secretary. Well, as I mentioned earlier on, uh, and I've, as I've stated on a number of occasions, it's important that the police are able to respond to the changing nature of our society and the changing nature of crime. And that's about making sure that the police service is able to keep pace with those changes, both at a societal level and also at a crime level. And the intention behind the strategy, as the Chief Constable has set out, is to make sure that the police service in Scotland are able to meet those challenges effectively, delivering better capacity within Police Scotland and, at the same time, a better service to the public. I am very clear about the need to make sure that that is delivered. That is why I have said on a number of occasions it is about getting the right staff mix within our police service so that we can deliver a first-class service to the people of Scotland and to keep them safe. I will continue to have discussions with the Chief Constable over the coming weeks as the consultation is taken forward and after the consultation is being completed and how we can make sure that Police Scotland are able to do that, not just in some parts of Scotland but right across the country. Question number two, Daniel Johnson. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government, in light of reports that one in ten training places are going unfilled, what action is it taking to encourage more people into teaching? Cabinet Secretary John Swinney. 
Officer, the Government is determined to create an education system which is world class and teachers have a vital role to play in helping to achieve that ambition. Increasing the number of teacher training places available is crucial, which is why we are taking a number of actions to support universities to meet them. We are spending £88 million this year to make sure every school has access to the right number of teachers. We are investing £1 million from the Scottish Attainment Fund to open up new and innovative routes into the profession. And I recently launched our new teacher recruitment campaign, Teaching Makes People, building on the success of last year's campaign, which helped drive a 19% increase in PGDE applications to Scottish universities compared to the previous year. I want to see our universities build on this success and take further steps to attract high-quality students into their teacher education programmes. Daniel Johnson. I thank the Minister for that answer. As the Scottish Funding Council said about last year's cycle, one of the main problems with ensuring a good match between subject targets and intakes is that, and I quote, the timing of the announcement of intakes. An early announcement helps universities to plan and helps the government's recruitment campaign. Last cycle, the Scottish Government sent guidance to the Scottish Funding Council in December. When did, this uh, when did the government send their guidance to the Scottish Funding Council for this cycle? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, the uh, advice was sent to the Funding Council in advance of the announcements that have been made and the decisions that have been set out to enable the uh, universities to take forward the recruitment that is necessary. Daniel Johnson. Um, thank you, Presiding Officer. Maybe I can help the Cabinet Secretary. The fact is that the Scottish Funding Council only received its annual guidance from the Scottish Government on the 14th of February. That's eight weeks later than last year. Last year, they got it before Christmas. This year, they had to wait until Valentine's Day. On the second problem identified by the Scottish Funding Council, the lack of student demand for some subjects, the government launched a campaign this month. But this was also a month behind last year's efforts. The fact is, universities still don't know what their allocation and how many teaching students that they uh, can recruit will be. We all support efforts to boost the number of teachers and support this vital profession. This is rightly a top priority for the government. So why are the eight weeks behind last year and does the minister commit to do better for next year's recruitment cycle? Cabinet Secretary. As, as with most things about the education system, Mr Johnson's enthusiastic support for the government's approach is very closely veiled by the way in which he articulates his arguments in Parliament. Uh, it takes a lot of digging to find out Mr Johnson's firm support for the government's intention. I, th I would have thought Mr Johnson would have taken this opportunity to welcome the fact that the government has significantly increased the number of places that are available for individuals to enter into teacher education and that Mr Johnson would have wanted to weigh in behind the government's efforts to ensure that more and more young people decide to choose to enter into that more and more people decide to enter into the teaching profession. That's what our approach is designed to do, to make sure we can recruit the number of teachers to fill the teacher vacancies, which Mr Johnson is Would always Mr. Johnson moaning, stop talking, please? Which Mr Johnson is always moaning and whinging yeah. about. And if Mr Johnson I was asked a question on Friday, presiding yeah. officer, at an event in the Caird Hall in Dundee in front of hundreds of teachers. And they asked me, what would improve the perception of Scottish education? And I said, if some members of parliament improved the way in which they talked about Scottish education. And the person, the person that I had uppermost in my mind was Mr. Daniel Johnson. Jenny Gilruth. Uh, thank you, presiding officer. Can I remind members, I am the PLO to the cabinet secretary for education. Uh, clearly, thank you. Clearly, we need to ensure there are enough places and sufficient take-up of those places at university for teachers. But an important part of that training is the opportunity for probationary teachers. Can the Cabinet Secretary advise what the Scottish Government does to support probationary teachers and what progress has been made on providing employment to teachers after they complete their probationary year? Cabinet Secretary. So the, the Government has, as part of the last local government settlement in 1617, uh, made available £37.6 million pounds to local authorities to secure places for all probationers uh, who require one. Um, we work closely with um, local authorities to allocate places, and I can confirm that places have already been found for all el eligible students uh, in, since 2002. And at the last available census, 87% of probationer teachers uh, were in permanent or temporary employment which is a very encouraging figure, showing more teachers, uh, probationer teachers, are finding employment and stability. Liz Smith. 
Uh, thank you. Um, has the Scottish Government had any discussions at all with the teacher training bodies to establish how many professionally qualified potential applicants from other jurisdictions would be able to fill some of these places if their qualifications were recognised in Scotland? Cabinet Secretary. Um, well, there's a, there's a number of issues that uh, pertain there. Um, one of them is about the free movement of individuals. And I would have thought Liz Smith might have thought more carefully about the asking me the question that she's just asked me, given the position that her United Kingdom government takes on the approach of individuals being able to apply to come in to teach in Scotland um, as a consequence of some of the issues with which we are wrestling and will be debating in the course of this afternoon. Um, now, obviously, on, in relation to some of the issues about accreditation and registration of teachers, I'm in regular dialogue with the General Teaching Council for Scotland to ensure that the General Teaching Council are taking every step they possibly can do to ensure that individuals who have uh, the requisite qualifications in other jurisdictions, principally south of the border or perhaps uh, in uh, the north of Ireland as well, are able to um, have the most efficient and seamless transfer of their registration into the Scottish system, whilst of course, and I'm sure Liz Smith would agree with me on this point, assuring the quality of any applications that are made by individuals. So the GTCS is very firmly focused on that point. And in relation to the Colleges of Education, I have um, had direct discussions myself with the Colleges of Education about the importance of these issues and uh, they have been fully involved in the discussions around the planning of the teacher intake numbers that we take forward. Question number three, Lee MacArthur. Thank you, President yeah. Officer. To ask the Scottish Government whether the Highlands and Islands Enterprise Board will retain its current strategic, operational and budgetary decision-making powers in accordance with the recent vote in the Parliament. Cabinet Secretary Keith Brown. Uh, as I have mentioned many times before, Presiding Officer, I remain committed to keeping High firmly in place and at the heart of the Highlands and Islands economy, which is why I asked Professor Lorne Creerer, Chair of High, to lead discussions with the other agency chairs and some members of the Ministerial Review Group and to provide me with his views on the principles and proposals for a strategic board. I am currently reflecting on the detail of the proposals outlined by Professor Creerer the views of the Ministerial Review Group and those expressed by wider interests in taking forward the development of the Strategic Board. I remain committed to the services and support that Hyde provides and I'm happy to listen to members across the Chamber in order to discuss the way forward ahead of a statement to Parliament in the coming weeks. Liam MacArthur. Thank the Cabinet Secretary and while he's reflecting on it, maybe reflect on the views of Inverness-based economist Tony Mackay who described the clear report as a whitewash and I wonder if the report's recommenda recommendations are implemented, the role of the Highs Board will be reduced to a mere delivery. It will be answerable to a new centralised super board chaired by an SNP minister. The loyalty of Highs Chair would be to Edinburgh, to the minister, with the needs of the Highlands and Islands, our businesses and communities, uh, a secondary consideration. How can the Cabinet Secretary square that with the expressed will of this Parliament to retain the full current powers of the High Board? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, well, can I say, first of all, a number of the points which um, Lee MacArthur makes are speculative as to how the strategic board, for example, will be composed and some of the other outcomes he mentioned. But it's also true to say, and he's right to mention the uh, results uh, or the comments that were made by an individual in the Highlands. There have been a number of different comments. For example, uh, members of COHE, the Convention of the Highlands and Islands, who, uh, when I and the Deputy First Minister met with them uh, last week, a number expressed support for the continuation of the board. I acknowledge that point, but also said that the nature of the board had to change to take account of developing circumstances. We've also seen comments from High themselves, which have been supportive. We've also seen uh, comments from a number of other uh, uh, commentators too. So I think the important point, as I've said now a number of times, is to listen to those points, including the points which Liam MacArthur has made. And I've also uh, asked my office to arrange meetings with each of the uh, other groups as well to see if we can uh, come to some common ground in relation to this and to listen to the points that I've made. I've said I've been willing to listen and I've talked to some members uh, from the chamber, but it's much better if we can have direct com conversations about that. So I think that's the right spirit to take these things forward. And perhaps some of the fears which Liam MacArthur has expressed might not come to fruition. But the best chance of achieving that kind of outcome would surely be to have a dialogue about what may happen in the final stages of phase two of the review. Liam MacArthur. Uh, thank you, President Officer. I've listened carefully to what the Cabinet Secretary said, and let me make it clear that I don't um, believe this is about the political affiliation uh, of the Minister. This is an arrangement I would not support 
under any minister at all. Professor Jim Hunter is right when he says this is centralism run riot. He remains unconvinced. In the Press and Journal yesterday, he said the changes would subject High's no longer autonomous board to constant outside oversight and direction, claiming it will be, quote, no good for the Highlands and Islands or for Scotland. Cabinet Secretary mentioned the discussions uh, at the Convention of the Highlands and Islands in Shetland last week. Can he tell the Chamber whether the Convention backed his latest proposals? Cabinet Secretary. Well, the Convention didn't have sight of Lorne Creer's proposals at that time. They weren't published. They did have a number of uh, uh, the characteristics of what he had to say, and there was strong support for what he had to say, but I would uh, want to acknowledge the fact he didn't have the full detail of that at that time. It was in advance of the Ministerial uh, Review Group. The two uh, defining characteristics of the response was general support for the retention of a, a board for high. Uh, I've mentioned that already, but also an acknowledgement that the nature of that board had to change. And two other points. Uh, one, that the board itself had to change because circumstances had changed. Most particularly the point about the regional development assistance which the Highlands and Islands have had through the European Union over many years and the threat that Brexit presents to that continuation, the continuation of that development. That was a, a matter of real concern and for that reason, if for no other, the acknowledgement was that things had to change. And in addition to that, the need for collaboration, a vital part of Lorne Creer's report. If you take the example of the uh, aluminium smelter at Fort William, that was a result of work done by Scottish Enterprise, ministers and people from different agencies collaborating. That kind of thing should happen automatically, and that's what I think uh, Lorne Creer was pointing towards. But as I say, these are Lord Creer's, uh, Lorne Creer's proposals. These are not the proposals of the Scottish Government. We are willing to listen and to discuss it with willing partners. Rhoda Grant. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Um, the Creer Report recommends retention of the High Board. However, it would be subject to the Strategic Board and therefore to the control of Scottish Government. High was set up to benefit the Highlands and Islands. Can I ask the Minister, will he listen to public opinion and could he also explain to this Parliament why government backbenchers had access to the Creer Report and thereby so did the press before other members of this Parliament? Cabinet Secretary. I think I've said on a number of occasions that, yes, of course, I'm willing to listen to uh, different uh, shades of opinion. I've made that point repeatedly. What I've not had yet is the direct conversations that would support that uh, listening exercise. So, as I say, I have contacted the other parties to say if they want to have that discussion, then uh, I'm more than happy to do that. And to do that in advance of the statement, when I'll come back to Parliament uh, in the next few weeks to say what the outcome or view is on the governance review held by Lorne Creer. And can I say that I think uh, Lorne Creer has undertaken a tremendous piece of work. He has not undertaken it uh, under the direction of ministers. He's been asked to do this. He's discussed it with other agency chairs. It's a broad-based piece of work. And it does acknowledge, and it's important to say this, it tries to take forward a number of things which different members, different parties in this chamber all say they are committed to, to raising Scotland's economic performance, to making sure that we do it in a much more collaborative way amongst the agencies. I would have thought if we have that as a starting point, then we can certainly agree on some of the other issues around uh, the nature of the strategic board and how collaboration uh, should best work. So I'm more than happy to have that discussion uh, with Rhoda Grant, uh, indeed with uh, other members across the chamber. I've made the offer before, it's a sincere offer, and I hope members will take it up. Thank you. That concludes topical.